Hey, so I want to back up just a, a little bit. When you came out of the academy, I mean, you've been on for quite a long time, and, and mm -hmm. we now know you last nine years you've been with the league there. What was your first assignment? Uh, were you walking on a walking beat, a uh, two-man car? How's that work in LAPD, and what were some of the different areas of town and assignments you worked in? Okay, so, you know, LAPD, one thing I like about LAPD is is that you always have a partner. I mean, so that's, in my opinion, you can get a lot more stuff done because you, mm -hmm. you can investigate more because you have a backup guy right there. Plus, the day goes by quicker because you can shoot the shit. And just like the movie End of Watch, you see the, the back and forth in the car. Yep. But out of the academy, um, they they assigned me to Van Nuys Division. And before we, we leave the academy, they asked you to do three choices. I didn't get any of my choices. They sent me to Van Nuys. I was there as a, as a probationary officer, and we call him a P1. I hated Van Nuys. I wanted to go further south where the action was. Uh, and, and back then, everything was different. Everything was like, we didn't have computers. So we, everything was written by hand. Times are so much different than it is now. So I did my probation at Van Nuys. And then right before you leave, you get to put in your three choices to where you want to get transferred to. Because once you finish probation, they transfer you out, right? And I said, I'm going I'm to go back to the south. I'm going to go south and all this other stuff. They sent me to Central Division, which is Skid Row, right? Which actually turned out to be okay because the one thing that's good about Central back in, in uh, the early 90s, oh, you got to remember, my last week on probation, the Rodney King riots broke out. Jeez. So I, I, I was um, – actually, I think I, I was off probation. I think I was off probation, but I hadn't transferred yet. So, um, so I had about a year under my belt. The Rodney King riots break out. And at this point, I had never been to South Central. And so – um, that, that riot was an actual riot. The, the 2020 is more like a civil unrest, right? Where, you know, you got, you got idiots <laughs> acting stupid and burning. The other yeah. one was violent. People died in that one. Like yeah. it was up in like 20 or 30 people died easily. They're shooting at firemen. So that was a violent one. And it was more contained in South Central. Remember they had RTD, uh, uh, buses, but now they're called MTA. If, if there's any buses that were traveling during that time of the riots, People didn't know it because the windows are tinted. It's full of police, and so they would they would um, take everybody to a uh, command post. It was at Fifty Fourth and Arlington, and uh, you get there, and there's so many different police departments. There's so many cops and police departments, and so I remember getting into a line, like an assembly line, and they had this big old bin of shotguns. And you walk up, you go, "Yeah, I need a shotgun." They give you a shotgun. I need ammo. You get ammo. I need a radio. I had never seen anything like it. Before or since that, it was just like an assembly line of grabbing equipment. It was crazy. Wow. So, so I remember I, I was the driver. We had, I had three partners who were cruising around South Central, you know, places are on fire and the National Guard was, was coming in. And I remember there was a help call. One of our officers was going to work at 77th. I didn't know him at the time. I, I since have, I know him now. Mm -hmm. It was Brian Liddy. And Brian's a, a male white, kind of a big guy. Well, that off ramp is a, is a very large off ramp. And I guess the gangsters, said, hey, we're going to park at the top of the off-ramp. Any white guy is going to be a cop going to the police station. We're going to shoot, shoot him. So Brian's coming off the freeway. He looks over, and the one guy sitting in the middle leans over to shoot Brian. Brian shoots, hits the guy right through the eye. Wow. So the car, yeah, the car crashes, just like the movie. It never happens in real life, but it actually did. The car caught on fire. So mm -hmm. Brian jumps out. He's in a gun battle with, with the other two guys who are still alive, and he goes empty. And then out of his peripheral, he sees a male black running at him with a gun. He's like, oh, I'm done. And that guy runs up and goes, L.A. Sheriff Deputy. He's off-duty deputy. So he comes <sighs> over, and he engages and uh, saved Brian's ass. And so I think Brian was able to, to reload, get some ammo out of the car. I responded. Remember, I didn't know about South Central at this point. I responded as they're pulling out the dead body out of the burning car. There's still two outstanding suspects. The crowd's forming. So that was my introduction in, into South Central. Wow. And then, so when I left the Van Nuys, I transferred to Central Division. The good thing about Central Division back then, rock cocaine was crazy. And so you got to be an expert at, at, at narcotics pretty quick with heroin and rock cocaine and, and all that stuff. And an interesting story, when I first got to, to Central Division, this is 92 now, right? This old timer comes and gets me, right? He's like, hey, kid, come here. It's funny because now I feel, I guess I'm the old timer. So this guy goes, hey, hey kid, come here. <laughs> And he, and he and he looks at the uh, there's a male an older male black in the, in the holding tank. He goes, "Do you know who that is?" I said, "No, sir." He goes, "That's Jimmy Lee Smith." He also goes by Jimmy Youngblood. Does that ring a bell? And just so happens, I seen the movie of uh, the Onion Field, and that was one of the suspects who shot and killed our officer. 
back in the 60s. If cool. you haven't seen the movie, if you haven't seen uh, it's a very young James Woods plays the, one of the suspects. He plays the white guy. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, he's very young. It's a great movie. Joseph Lombaugh, who's a, who's a retired LAPD detective, he writes a lot of movies and stuff. He wrote the book that became a movie. Well, that was one of the suspects. Now, according to that, he was there, but he wasn't the shooter. So he did. He got out of jail, and now he's he's a hype. So he's you know downtown Los Angeles using drugs. And just so the the viewers and listeners understand, the Onion Field. To just give you a little brief history on LAPD, they were driving a plane car, like a crime suppression unit. They pull over a car, unbeknownst to them, these guys were robbery suspects. They were going around robbing stores and they got the drop on one of the officers. They put the gun to his head and they said, drop your gun, drop your gun. Well, the guy dropped his gun because we, at the time we had no policy about giving up your gun. Mm -hmm. Well, because that incident, LAPD changed their policy and we will never give up your gun to anybody, right? Well, once you get the gun, they kidnapped these two LAPD officers who were on duty took him to Bakersfield, California, to the onion fields at night. And he ended up shooting um, Ian Campbell. Uh, he died. And, and when he was shooting him, the other officer took off in the darkness and got away. And then both those suspects got caught. So going back to 92, the old timer goes, and once he said that, I go, I recognize the name. Yes, sir. He goes, when it, we have a standing order here in Central Division. If you see him walking the street, you pick him up, you book him from under the influence of, of heroin. And he goes, because it's a mandatory 90 day sentence and he'll do a life sentence 90 days at a time. Mm. And that was, that I was like, yes, sir. You know, uh, you know, I never, and that, that was the one and only time I ever saw uh, Jimmy Lee Smith was the day is fairly soon after I got to uh, central. So I, I did a couple of years at central division. Like I said, it turned out to be actually a, a really good experience there for me, but it was time to leave. I still wanted to, Go where, where a little bit more action was, but I got to learn my 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 dope. I worked the night shifts there when I was there. It was a great great area to work. So then I went to seventy seventh division, and in seventy seventh division, I got there in ninety four, and um, I, I think that was in ninety four ninety five. We led the city in homicides that year. Wow! And I think we had, I think we had a hundred and some homicides. I take it back. In the nineties, we take it back. We we had we had over three hundred homicides in our our division, and the city had over a thousand homicides that that year. Whoa! Back in the nineties, we had a lot of, and and now the city maybe gets three hundred in the whole whole city. Back then, it was we over a thousand. Um, so our division led uh, that that city, and you know, a little bragging rights. They made shirts that said "One Eighty Seven Champs." You know, it was kind of like a little bragging rights that that we worked the most violent that we worked the most violent area, I guess. Right? But seventy seventh was uh, a, an absolute. Great time. I got to work the old station. Uh, it was built in 1925 also. And that was the, that was the 12th division established right before. Uh, it was actually the same year, but that, that, that one became the 12th division. Uh, Newton became the 13th. Um, I, I ended up in a couple of shootings. So they benched me. Uh, we, get, we get too many shootings right away. Sometimes they'll, they'll put you in detective for a while or whatever. And I was like, yeah, I'm not built out for this detective stuff. I'm, I'm a gunfighter. I got to go in the street. You know, I'm God's gift to police work. I thought you know, when you're young on the job, aren't we all? So, so I put in for Newton division and it turns out my, one of our sergeants at uh, 77th, her brother was the captain at, um, at Newton division. And we all laugh, but Jim Tatro, who was the captain at the time of, of Newton division was known for taking all the black sheep, you know, all, all the guys are getting in trouble, but he knew that we were good workers. Mm-hmm. Just, so we, you know, like you said, shit magnets or whatever. So right. he, within a month, within a month, I transferred to Newton, which is unbelievably fast. So I went to Newton division while I was at Newton division, uh, still doing the same thing, chasing guns down. So one thing I like to do is like to chase guys with guns back then. And then I got, I got to work a, uh, a special problems unit. And then out of there, four of us started up a, a career criminal unit. They called it. It's a plain clothes unit where uh, Tatro brought us in and goes, listen, we have a lot of homicide suspects and robbery suspects that are identified that we can't locate. Your job is to locate bad guys, no property crimes, violent suspects. And back in the nineties, there was never a shortage of violent suspects. Right. So what was interesting was we didn't have anything. So we, we had to go out and, and scrape together undercover cars. So I had to learn how to get a hold harmless car from an insurance company that, that it was a previously stolen car that, that after it's recovered and the victims paid off, then we get them to use as undercover cars. And um, so we did a lot of, a lot of cool things in that unit to where we used a lot of tricks and ruses to, to catch suspects. I mean, some of them were, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you one story real quick. Cause it's kind of, kind of cool. There was a, uh, a murder suspect that was wanted. And so when we, 
get a case from the detectives, we used to look through their, their murder book, which is like a, a homicide book. They call it a murder book. Right. As we're, we're looking through it, we read that the suspect's mother was on a, a, a oxygen tank. She had some kind of medical illness and that she had an ink in-house nursing. They would come several times a week. Uh-huh. So we said, Hey man, let, let's, let's go talk to her. Well, we already had a plan. So we stopped by 77th dispensary. We grabbed a couple of scrubs. So we looked like the nursing people. And then uh, we had one guy wear a suit. So it looks more like, like the administrator part guy. So we went to the house of the suspect's mom and we're like, Hey, we got to fill out. We got to update your medical information in case you have another stroke or, or whatever you call it, next of kin and stuff. And I said, also, then we got down to like, Hey, in case you need another blood transfusion, cause she needed one in the past. I said, you know, we need some possible people that might be a match to you. Usually relatives are the best. So then she's named off her, like her siblings. We're like, damn, we want her son. We're like, well, if you have any children, cause normally children are actually a better match for you. And then she gave us her, her son and he had a burner phone. So we got that number. So then I called the fire department. And I said, hey, man, we're, we're going to call this guy and make up a ruse that his mom has a medical emergency and that uh, I'll fill that part in. So I said, can you park an ambulance out front of the house? It looks good if the guy comes up. Right? He goes, yeah, we can do that. But if we get a call, we got to leave. So as soon as, the, as soon as the RA got there and parked in front of the house, we called the guy and we said, hey, this is so-and-so from the so-and-so nursing uh, company. Your mom had a stroke. We don't think she'll survive throughout the night, uh, but she's refusing medical treatment. But you're on the emergency card. You can override her. So if, if you come here, you sign the, the release, we can take her to the hospital. He's like, I'm in Hawthorne. I'll be there in 20 minutes. He comes running to the house. We arrest him. I mean, it was that, <laughs> that simple. So so, so we did, we, did a, we did a lot of that kind of stuff back in the 90s, which was, which was nicer uh, to do. Well, I think it back. It wasn't a cell phone. It was this pager number we had because back then we had pagers. He called, our, he, called, he called our number. So we did that. And then I left there. I got administratively transferred. Um, Wait a minute. Before you I, tell I, that story, you, you mentioned something and it kind of glossed over it. A special problems unit? What is that? Yeah. So, so LAPD is the Department of Acronyms. So it was called a SPU unit, SPU, and Special Problems Unit. And that, that was, uh, we did some plain clothes, but a lot of it was, was uniform. And we didn't handle radio calls. We just went out there and, and just whatever crimes or shootings are happening in the area, we would flood that area and try to get guns off the street. If there's something else going on, we'd flood it. So that was just a special promise unit to whatever, like if there's a burglaries for motor vehicles, they would send us over by the courthouse. It, whatever it might be, that's what that Got did, it. which Got was it. okay. But but the career criminal unit was a much better unit to work. Yeah, yeah. So, All right. so, so at that point, being active that I was back in the day, the department saw fit that to transfer me to a slower division. So they admin transferred me, administratively transferred me to West Valley Division which is a, a little bit slower. It's in the Valley. Mm-hmm. So I did my 12 months there. And then I uh, immediately transferred back to Newton division and uh, <laughs> went back to Newton division was, was kicking ass there, uh, ended up getting it into a shootout um, there. And um, right after that, I, I, I knew it was going to happen because of, of the, the prior shootings and stuff. Uh, they're like, yeah, you need to leave. I mean, you're not, not going to work Newton anymore. So they administratively transferred me to Devonshire division, which is known as club dev. How did they want you to leave? What was the significance, significance of that shooting? Well, it's because I've been in prior shootings too, too many. That shooting there was, it's a long story on that one. That, that's for another day. But we ended up in the backyard at night. We ended up engaging in two suspects, with two suspects in, in a shooting. But because of the volume of shootings I've been in in the past, the, uh, they, they put me on what they call risk management because, you know, I'm a liability to the department if I'm getting in, into shootings. So they, they sent me to a slower part of the city, which is called Devonshire Division, which they, they also nicknamed Club Dev. So I remember sitting into the, uh, the deputy chief's office and he's like, you know, Jamie, I know your family. And and because uh, he was also lived in my neighborhood and he goes, something happens to you. I feel terrible. So I'm going to send you to, to Devonshire Division. And I remember looking at him. I go. Is that the place they call Club Dev? He goes, yeah. And I go, can't you send me to like Hollywood or something? Because Hollywood's busy. And he goes, no, 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 you're going to Devonshire. I was like, before I had a, we have a week before they transfer me. So the transfer order comes out. You see all the people, all the movement. Jim Tatro, who was my original captain the first time at, at Newton, was was now, he's either, I think he was at robbery homicide at the time as a captain there. He calls me up and he goes, hey, I called uh, Joe Carreri, who's the captain of Devonshire. I told him to take care of you, but don't tell him I called you. I'm like, all right. All right. So I, I get to Devonshire Division my first night. I'm working graveyard. I end up in a foot pursuit, rip my shirt. And then I get a note saying, hey, see the captain in the morning. So I show up in the captain, who is Joe Carreri. And my shirt's hanging off my, my shoulder. He goes, what, what happened to you? I was, I was in a foot pursuit last night, my first night. You know? So he kind of grinned. He goes, hey, uh, 
Jim Tatro called me, told me some good things about you. He goes, what do you want to work while you're here? And I'm, I'm just a P2 police officer. I had about, I don't know, I'm trying to think here, probably 12 years on the job at the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, sir, I go, sir, I just want to do my 12 months and go back to Newton. He goes, well, about that. The department says you got to be gone two years this time <laughs> instead of one, like the last time. I'm like, wow. So he goes, he goes, so think about it. So I ended up um, in, a, in a short amount of time, I, I wrote up a proposal to do another career criminals type of unit in, uh, in Devonshire. And so I proposed it to him. I said, hey, how about this? And he looks at it. He goes, you know what? That sounds good. And he goes, we're short on supervisors. So you'll just answer straight to me. Now, you got to understand LAPD. This is unheard of, right? Especially with somebody being on risk management. And the hours we worked were the nighttime hours and he worked the daytime. So we really didn't have a super. And here I am, a 12-year guy, and I'm going to be in charge of three other officers who are all my same rank, uh, who had less time than me. So because of my connections with the undercover cars, I knew where to go to get them. So I got the mm-hmm. undercover cars for us again. And we're out there and we are just taking all, you know, here's the thing. People say Devonshire's slow. There's a lot of crime out there, man. And people, it's just untapped, I guess. And, you know, when you work a plainclothes assignment, you're able to get a lot closer and up, up close and personal and, and see a lot more things. So we literally would just walk up on people doing stuff. So we started getting a lot of guns off the street in that area, started getting a, um, just a wide variety of craziness stuff. So I did that for three years, actually. It turned out to be a, turned out to be a good career move, mm-hmm. to be honest with you, because I think if I would have stayed in Newton and, and continued on the path where I was going, I probably would have gotten into some more trouble. Just because you're out there chasing the gun and chasing bad guys, you're, you're going to end up – if you're chasing guys with guns, you're going to get into more shootings. If you're chasing – people with stolen cars, you're going to get in more pursuits. It's just, just right. that's just the way it works. Right. And so I ended up, I ended up making a detective out of there. I promoted and, um, and where they send me as, as a brand new detective, Van Nuys, back to Van Nuys where I started, which I hated that place. <laughs> so I'm, so I'm, so I'm, so I'm sitting at, at, um, at Van Nuys and I'm miserable and, um, not, you know, I really don't wear a suit and tie type of job. I'm always wearing plain clothes is what I usually have done. And so, um, about 11 months into my detective position, I get a call from Joe Carreri, the captain. And uh, he goes, hey, man, he goes, um, I'm over here at Foothill now, which is another Valley division. He goes, you want to come over here as a detective and start up another plane closure for me? And I'm like, hell yeah. yeah. So, so, he, so he, he transfers me over to Foothill. And um, I end up starting another unit with, a, with another guy, Rod Rodriguez, who used to work SIS, which is our, one of our premier units here. And he and I started the unit. We picked a couple of police officers to work with us. And then about six months later, my name came up to make sergeant. And I was going to pass it up because I was like, dude, I don't want to be a sergeant. I'm having fun doing this thing, you know, being a detective, working this unit. And my captain career, he goes, he goes, no, no, you, you take that promotion. You do it for six months, get off probation, and then you can downgrade yourself back into your position as a detective. Because he's looking out for my career. And I go, I go, okay, well, where do they send me as a sergeant? West LA, which is probably the sleepiest area in the city. It's, it's Brentwood, Bel Air, you know, mm-hmm. all the, all the Richie area, right? Yeah. yeah. So they call it West Latte because that you go there, you just drink your lattes and drive around, right? There's really <laughs> nothing happening there. So, so I went there, I was miserable. So I, so after I got six months under my belt as a, as a sergeant and I, I secured that rank, um, I was going to downgrade to a, a detective one. And then Captain Crary calls me and says, Hey, uh, we just promoted your partner to a detective three. So we have a detective two job, which is a supervisor rank. He goes, just lateral over here, take the interview and I'll make you the, the, the supervisor of the unit. So I did that. And then me and my partner, and then, and then I was the de- detective supervisor. Instead of replacing my rank, uh, D1, they, we went with uh, three police officers. So we did that for, gosh, another, another five years, I think. I think it was like another five years working that unit. Wow. And, and yeah, and we, we did all kinds of work, man. Working with, like I said, informants, getting, getting some good stuff. And we went wherever it led, it, it led us to go. And Crary loved us. And uh, this, this goes to show what a good leader is. So Joe Crary comes yeah. in one day and I tell him, I say, Hey, our informant tells us that uh, this one guy we're looking for, who's in, in his same gang is they're all going to, and he's on the run. He's going to be in Las Vegas. They're all going to go meet him in Las Vegas, but he's not going to give him up because that's his buddy. But he's telling us he's going to be in Las Vegas. So I ended up talking to my informant, and he wouldn't tell me where they're going to be staying, nothing, because he goes, hey, I can't rat out my my homeboy that we're looking for. So one day while he's in Vegas, my, my informant calls me, 
and, and I used to use a, a street name, a moniker of Red. That was that's what all my informants call me. It was just they call me Red. That way, if I text them or call them, it shows up as Red on their cell phone, and not McBride. Right. So uh, he goes, "Hey, Red." He goes, "Man," he goes. Room service is expensive here in Las Vegas. And I'm joking around like, what do you mean room service? Not, they don't have that at Motel 6. He goes, no, man, we're staying at Treasure Island. <laughs> so he ends up telling me by accident where he's staying. So I, so I tell Carreri, our captain, I said, hey, captain, I said, the informant is hanging out with this guy and they, they're staying at Treasure Island. He looks at me and he goes, all right, pick one of your guys, go to Vegas, I'll hook up with one of their their um, fugitive teams and uh, and see if you can apprehend him. He goes, but you're only there as an observer. Because if we go, if we go there, he has to get clearance from higher ups too. Right. And so he, he, so he just, pick, you know, he goes, pick one of your guys. So we take our car, we're driving to Vegas. And of course we take a picture in front of the, the Vegas sign, like, Hey, we're working. And uh, the guys end up tracking the car, put a tracker on it. And it, it all, it all worked out great. But I mean, can you believe that? I mean, just trusting us to go to Vegas. He didn't even felt the paperwork to have us go. He just sent us to Vegas. You know, he, he was such a great guy, but once he retired, and we started getting new captains in. I don't think they really had a true understanding of, of our unit, what we did, which which ended up leading to that, that big personnel complaint that we had where internal affairs thought we were dirty cops and all that stuff, which we weren't. From there, from, from Foothill, I ended up um, going to that Board of Rights I talked about. You know, I was off for six months and stuff. And then when I came back, I ran and, and won within four months my office here at the, at the union. So I came to the union. Yeah, is what I did, and really that and that was out of career survival is why I did that. I I've never worked an inside job until I got here, but once I got here, it's different because it's not really police work, but I still get to do all kinds of stuff to help coppers out when they get complaints, and I still get to investigate stuff because I I do my investigations to clear them because yep. I know internal affairs ain't. We got some good people in internal affairs, but we've got some shitty people in internal affairs too. Right, and so and so my thing is I I got to I feel I got to do my my job and and find the evidence because I can't trust them to find it, to clear the officers. Well, and I think that was the thing, even with the feds, when you have the officer's uh, professional responsibility, you know, OPR, it's still internal affairs. And, and there's, there's like an inherent distrust of whoever's assigned to internal affairs because you think, yeah. well, they're out to get us, the, the, the mm -hmm. police officers who are just trying to do their job. But the golden thing is when you get people like yourself that go into those units and they're there to, Let's look at this objectively. Let's don't go in with a jaded view that, oh, somebody complained, so the cop's wrong. You know, if you do well, it, it, you know how it is. It, if but, you're doing your job, you're going to get complaints. Well, exactly. And Steve, you know it. When you become an investigator, you know, um, you're supposed to be an unbiased fact finder. Hmm. And here's what I tell people. In my opinion, a lot of people that work internal affairs too long or even sex crimes investigators that work that too long, they become believers that everything they hear about the officers, you know, it's probably true. Um, a lot of times because I've dealt with sex crime investigators, not all of them, so don't, don't send me hate mail, but, but some of them think like, oh yeah, th they said they got raped. And so they, and it turns out it, it was all bullshit. So I think, I think some people that work some of these units too long become tunnel vision. They think that they, they become believers. And I think yeah. we have term limits on how long you, you can work internal affairs, but like anything, the department twists things. And so you got people doing twice as long, three times as long in internal affairs. Yeah. They, got, they, they got an extension. They got an extension. I'm like, dude, you're killing me here. You're breaking but, but, the rules. So, yeah. So so the last 10 years or nine, almost 10 years of working the, the union right now, uh, it's not like it's not the job I thought I was going to end my career in because I wanted to be out there chasing guns still and, and doing uh, the good work. Uh, but it was career survival because I'm the sole, I was the sole provider of a family of four. And I had to do something to, to make sure that, that I put food on the table and right. and make sure I still work to, work to extend my my uh, retirement. Right. And no. And, and you know, unfortunately, we need things like the the unions, uh, the different what we call the uh, association of what do we call it now? It's it's been so long. Well, Anyways, well, the there's, a, there's a, they have P, they have POAs. Yeah. The, yeah. the police police uh, association yeah. and the PBAs, the police, but yeah, yeah, the benevolence. And it's it's a shame that those individuals have to be FLEO. Fle that's what I was trying to think of federal law yeah. enforcement officer association, which when you remember that entitles you to an attorney when you're accused of different things. Right. And it's just but a you, shame you know, that it, it comes to that. Well, one thing, one thing that's good though, is uh, we've built strong relationships with, with other unions. So we have real strong unions with the sergeants association in uh, NYPD. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, uh, one of their sergeants, um, they had an overzealous DA that charged him with murder. Um, cause he was being attacked by somebody. I can't remember what weapon she had, but he ended up shooting her and killing her, but it was clear, um, 
that it was deadly force was, was warranted. Mm-hmm. And this overzealous DA charged him with murder. So we did a press conference on the steps of, of um, City Hall in New York. And uh, I was one of four speakers for him. And you just saw all these union agencies behind us from all over the United States. And uh, when we did that, because if LAPD, because we're, we're a big unit down here on the West Coast, and we team up with NYPD, that causes more media to go there. Mm-hmm. So, um, and the same thing, I, I did a press conference for San Francisco PD when one of their officers was charged with a crime there. And, and, and Sergeant Barry, by the way, ended up getting uh, acquitted you know, and rightfully so. But it shows that, you know, the union does have a purpose. And sometimes we got to reach out, you know, uh, across the aisle to help another union as well, because we're all brothers in blue, brothers and sisters in blue. It was just, uh, it was kind of an awesome thing, awesome thing to be a part of, because we had, there there were some people that that were presidents of of police unions. I'm like, what state are you from? Because I I didn't, I'd never heard of their police department before, but they all came. We we probably had over 50 people there in these stands lined up at, at City Hall. But it was pretty impressive. But yeah, there is a purpose for the union. Uh, you know, I think, uh, the, I hope, and from what I hear, good feedback that we're doing a pretty good job right now for, for our membership. Sounds like it. And we make no bones about it here on Game of Crimes. Nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop. So that's not what we're saying here, ladies and gentlemen, when you're listening. If, if it's a dirty cop, we'll be the first one to put their ass in jail. And if we can get a hold of the keys, we'll throw them away so they never get out of jail because they taint yeah. all of us. They make us all look bad. But just because you're accused of something, that's not the way our judicial system is. You're not automatically guilty. You're innocent until proven guilty. And right. you know what? I mean, there's an article route here in the last couple of days, the Breonna Taylor shooting in Louisville, Kentucky, with John Mattingly. I don't know if you met John at the Southern California Gang Conference. Yes. Excellent mm-hmm. speaker, has become a very close personal friend. And the other two officers that had been indicted for that shooting were just acquitted of everything. All charges were just dis- not acquitted. The charges were just flat dismissed. Because yeah. they're finding out now that all these pretty people who jumped on board and and simply because a black lady was killed by white officers, that automatically made the officers guilty. And that's what I that's what I love about John Mattingly. He'll t- he told us I've had him here on the show. One of the things he said is that was a needless shooting. There was absolutely no reason for Brianna Taylor to die that night, and it was all because of that crappy ass boyfriend who started mm-hmm. shooting at the cops. And unfortunately, Brianna was the, the victim in all of this. Right. Uh, I agree. Hey, you know, it, 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 Steve, it, it's the, it's the false narratives. It gets attached to a, to a, an edited footage, for example, mm-hmm. that, that creates this firestorm. So when, when uh, the 2020 came around, which in, in my uh, career was the worst time for law enforcement ever, mm-hmm. ever. Even, and I, again, I went through Rodney King. Right? It was the worst time. In fact, you know, they started talking about Brianna Taylor. Oh my God. I'm like, People, you guys don't know the whole story. They start mm-hmm. talking about all these other people they're, they're putting up there. I'm like, wait, did you know this? Did you know this? But they don't want to hear that. Right. And unfortunately, from all that blowback from 2020, law enforcement has been suffering ever since because every agency is having a hard time recruiting quality candidates. Absolutely. So, and so we, we, at one point, we had 10,000 officers here on LAPD. I think the last count was 8,700. Wow. Okay. And, and so when I came on, we had academy class every month uh, that had 130 people in the class, uh, and sometimes twice a month. And we were one of the smaller classes. We had 60. But mm-hmm. otherwise, all the other classes, in there, the time we were there, had 120 easily. And now when I go to speak in front of the class to talk about the union or whatever, we may have, may have 30 people in the class, not all LAPD. Because remember, other agencies send their people to our, our academy. So we might have 24 people there, LAPD. Wow. And out of that, out of that, People are quitting and because and, they realize, well, oh, this isn't for me because we're also recruiting the wrong people, right? right? The, the city of Los Angeles, LAPD used to handle our internal hiring, and then it went to the city of Los Angeles to do our hiring. Hmm. It's different. So they hire uh, Department of Water and Power, and they hire police, mm-hmm. and they don't know what to look for. So they got away from really recruiting from the, our military. Because remember, law enforcement is quasi-military. Yeah. That's why we use codes, and we have a rank structure and everything else. And so they really got away from that. And, and our psych, psych, uh, psychologists for a while were, were disqualifying combat veterans. It's like they didn't want anybody with combat experience. Right? Like they're, and, and, and their excuse was, oh, they have PTSD. They have PTSD. That, that was their, their trump card. So I always ask when I go, go into uh, academy class, how many people are in the military? Maybe two now. Wow. Maybe. Well, before it used to be like military, military, because it's, it's a natural transition. And then we got people coming in there that um, – I saw a girl with a, with a purple mohawk come into orientation. I'm like, I'm like how, how really? did you get past the interview? How did you get past the interview? 
And so even mm-hmm. though I have tattoos, I'm sleeved out, um, and I have facial hair, but if you see me in uniform, I shave mm-hmm. because our standard is, is no, no facial hair. I cover up my tattoos and I tell people, you know, this younger generation now, they're, they're getting butt hurt. So like, it's too hot. Why can't we show our tattoos and all this other stuff? And, and I've written an, an article on this too. And I, I go, listen, I go, I have skulls and grim reapers on my arm. Now imagine me responding to a house to notify the parents that their nine-year-old daughter was hit by a car and killed. Yeah. And here, uh, here they see is the grim reaper came to deliver the message. Yeah. I go, it's a, it's a, um, it's a professionalism. It's, it's what we should be showing at all times. And yep. so, and when I first came on, we were allowed to show our tattoos. And then about, I don't know, 20 years ago, they said no, because somebody had a tattoo of, of like a topless lady on their arm. And so they, they said no more tattoos. Well, we're, we're due for a new chief. And some of the candidates we interviewed from the union and we have, we have one candidate that's, that's an internal person that's applying for it who said flat out, I'll allow beards and tattoos and let them wear BDU uniforms. I'm like, we have a standard here that we're used to. If you see somebody get out of a car, they're an LAPD officer by looking sharp. You have no facial hair unless they have a mustache. Tattoos aren't showing. Otherwise, you have security guards that look more professional. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to mention the departments, but there's some other departments that five o'clock shadow, beards, they look sloppy. And then everybody's wearing this outer vest now. You see it now. They're like Everybody's wearing it. And, but these are the same people that talk about tactics. Oh, hey, we want to use this for tactics. I'm like, really? Let me take you now and shake you all over the place because now I got more things to grab on you and to yep. hold on to yep. and shake you around. And if you're wearing the, all this stuff, then obviously you haven't been in foot pursuits because you're not going to be able to go over walls with all the stuff here. Yep. So it's just – and what they do is they, they tuck their hands behind their vest all the time. Now I see that yep. all the time. It drives me nuts. Um, <laughs> you know, and I guess I, I guess I am that old timer. They're, they're waiting for me to go off so they can do whatever they want, I guess. But while I'm still here, I still bitch about it, you know, because um, it is Fine. professionalism. If I'm needing help, I don't want somebody that shows up looks like a bum. I want somebody that looks like they're squared away. Exactly. Even even back in the 70s on a small department on the midnight shift, we had a lieutenant that was a former Marine. And he's a tough guy. He didn't take crap off anybody. If he had to fight, he did. He was he loved peace. He would do everything he could to get out of a fight. But when he got in, he won. And we'd yeah. come in, and we've got five men on the shift. And you know what? He checked your shoes every night to make sure they were shining. Yep. He expected yep. professionalism. I, I agree with him 100% on that. But I want to ask you, so this movie, End of Watch, how, so that's loosely based on your career with another individual. Well, how true well, that's would you rate that movie? Okay, okay. So that's what they're saying. So nobody approached us, and uh, I didn't get any money for it. Nobody approached us. <clears throat> now, at the time we got into that shootout that I told you about, and I ended up transferring, right? mm-hmm. my partner and I were really hammering down on the 30 Pyrus. It's a black... Uh, gang out in, in Newton Division, and we were we were damaging their their drug sales. I mean, we were hammering every turn. And I remember um, it was a New Year's New Year's Eve going into New Year's Day is at midnight. It, it was right by the station. It was almost like a setup. It was kind of weird. We see this car. They see us. They roll through a stop sign. So we put on the lights, suits on. The guy opens the door. He's leaning out, shooting at us. Uh, wow. um, he jumps out. Of, he jumps out of the car, and, and the car takes off. He jumps up to. To, to shoot us turns out his, his guns in slide lock um, and they turn out to be 30 pyrus and 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 so we're hammering them so we're like hey man are they are they coming after us because we're we're hitting a lot of their places and then we hit another house that, that turned out to be a 30 pyru uh drug house and um end up in, in a uh that shootout i ended up getting shot in the finger <laughs> out of all that i got shot in the finger yeah and there's the finger but so if, if that's what they're basing on is is how how we were running our cases and all that stuff you know it wasn't a hispanic gang it was a black gang um, nobody died, got shot in the finger. So if that's what they're comparing it to, but as far as the end of watch, I've done movies before and I've also worked with a consultant on films and I got paid for that stuff. I didn't get paid for this. It, if, if it's based on our, if our careers, can somebody send me a check, please? Cause I haven't received one yet. Understood. understood. But a very good movie though. They definitely got the, uh, the camaraderie, right. You know, the, the bantering back and forth in the locker room and in the car what was um, I actually worked on a film with, with Michael Pena before, too, on another film. It's funny how these things come full circle. So how did you get involved with TV and film? Again, I wasn't looking for it. I was working in Newton Division, and my buddy Bob Deemer called me. And he goes, hey, man, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm working. And he goes, hey, I'm giving um, Tom Sizemore and Michael Mann a ride-along and for a TV show. And they need a skinhead to play in the pilot. Are you interested? And I'm like, no, I'm not interested in being in a TV show. And uh, he goes, well, come on, come on, come, come meet us. I go, all right, fine. So I met him at a street corner in East LA. 
And and they're, and they're, I'll be honest with you, the only reason why I went is because I go, I knew Michael Mann. I go, man, that, that name sounds familiar. I, yeah. I know him very well now, but I go, man, that sounds, that sounds familiar. I go, but, but Tom Sizemore, man, Saving Private Ryan. I love that movie. Right? Yeah. So I go, I go, so I, I end up going because of, of Saving Private Ryan, you know? So I end up going there and it was Tom Sizemore and Michael Mann, my partner, and it was, it was Bob and his partner. We were sitting there and, and they didn't mention anything about about the uh, tv show acting or nothing we're just we're just bullshitting and then i was there for like five minutes and i'm like i gotta meet my my other buddy for for dinner that night you know we're gonna take our code seven together so i'm like hey man nice meeting everybody i gotta roll see you later so a couple days later i get a call from michael mann's office and they want me to go do an audition so i go okay i'll i'll, I'll play along so i go into the <laughs> audition and i sit there and it's like i've had my hair off more than i had it on you know, you know, even early in my career, I've been shaving my head. And so I look around, you see people with freshly shaved heads, all white up here. Yeah. They're, they're going to try and get that skinhead point, right? <laughs> so I get there, I look around the room. I'm like, okay, so I'm reading the lines. And I was told that I was supposed to be an ex-cop who went to prison and then in prison aligned with the Aryan Brotherhood, like you talked about earlier, to, to survive. And, and, and now he's out on parole and he's doing a home evasion robbery. That's the character I was told. So I look at the lines and they sound so horny. So I just changed the lines around. They meant the same thing, but it, it just flows better when you talk naturally, right? Right, right. So I, I remember, <clears throat> so I walk in the room and uh, it was Michael Mann sitting down with some other guy, some lady with, with a camera and some lady standing in front of me. So Michael gets up. He's like, hey, nice to see you again. And I go, hey, did you have a good ride along and all that stuff? Oh yeah, great time. Yeah. So we talk a little bit. Then he sits back down and he's just staring at me. And I go, I'm sorry, I've never done this before. How do we, how do we start this thing? They all kind of giggle. And they go, oh, just act like there's a door in front of you, knock on it and she'll open it and go ahead and take the lines. I'm like, all right. So I did that. She opens the door and immediately I jump on her. I clamp her around the neck. And I act like I have a gun. I see clamp her. I'm pushing her back into the ground. I put my knee on her shoulder. I'm barking out commands to the imaginary people that are supposed to be with me. And when I got done with my, with my lines, I look over and Michael Mann and the other guy are, are up on the table, like looking over at me like this. And they had a really confused look on their face. And then he goes, uh, he goes, can, can you do that again? And so I get up and the lady gets up, her shirt's hanging off her shoulder a little bit. <laughs> Poor lady. <laughs> she, she, she gets up, she gets up and, and I do it again. And they go, hey, go, go wait out in the lobby. I said, okay. So Michael comes out there and they're taking my picture and stuff and they're real happy and stuff. So I, I don't know, a day or two later, I get another call. I didn't know it at the time, but the lady who I, I touched, I was choking out, and, and the lady that called me were very big casting directors. It was Janet Her uh, Janet uh, Hershenson and Jane Jenkins. And if you if you Google their name, they mm -hmm. do all the big movies. Right? And so, I think it was Janice called me. She goes, she goes, she goes, hey, um, hey, they loved you. They thought you were great. They they asked my partner Jane. They go, who'd you like? She goes, that cop. He scared me half to death. So she goes, hey, are, are uh, um. She says something about a SAG card. And I go, what's that? She starts laughing. She goes, we'll take care of that for you. Because I didn't even know what a SAG card was. Yeah, yeah. So so I ended up doing the pilot. I was, I was a, uh, we did a little bit of filming first. And then they sold it to a network. It was called Robbery Homicide Division with, with uh, Tom Sizemore as the lead. And then we had to come back and finish the, uh, um, the pilot. And so it's my face that you see, because I'm the bad guy. So it's my face you see on every commercial leading up to the, to the, um, the pilot. So anyways, after that, sometime later, Michael um, Mann's office calls me again. And they go, hey, Michael has another project. And he, he wants you to come down for an audition. It was uh, that movie Collateral with, with Tom Cruise. Oh, yeah. I said, I, said, I said, okay. So I go down there. And then um, Michael says, hey, Jamie, he goes, I'm going to have you read a cop part and a skinhead part. He goes, so I did them both. He goes, hey, I don't know which one I'm going to put you at yet, but you're definitely going to do one of them. I'm like, okay, cool. I end up playing a cop, but you know, whatever. So when I get out there to the first day of filming, Michael brings me over and he's telling some people that were there the story about when I did my audition. That's when I found out I'm not supposed to touch the lady. You're not supposed to touch the people you're having to, unless they tell you to. Oh. So here I am choking her out, pushing her out of the ground. So he's telling the story. I'm like, dude, I didn't, I didn't know. Me. Yeah, yeah. So, so I ended up doing collateral with him. And then Michael Mann and uh, actually Janet and Jane, the, the two casting directors, uh, actually got me my agent, Craig Wyckoff. So from there, I just, you know, started going out on auditions. I was either playing a cop or a killer. I was, I was fortunate enough to play in some pretty big movies and with some some pretty big people. And you know, it allowed me to, you know, I feel, like I said, I filmed a movie with uh, Michael Pena. They flew me to Arizona. They drove me over to, to Mexico. We're on a resort filming a movie in Mexico, you know. And I'm like, this is great, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then, I, you know, I, it's funny because I worked with three people before they became big stars. Uh, one of them was Michael Pena. 
Okay. So I show up, I'm playing a border patrol agent and we're, we're in the desert in Mexico. So I'm walking to my trailer <clears throat> and I see the next trailer is open. I see a Hispanic guy wearing the same outfit I'm going to be wearing. I'm like, Hey man, Jamie, I guess we're going to be partners. So we're talking and stuff and we're hanging out for about a week for filming. And, and so we're, we're getting to know each other. And he goes, he goes, man, I can't believe it, man. He goes, you've been doing this for 10 years since I was 19. He goes, I have about 50 credits under my name. He goes, I do one independent film and my career is taking off now. And I go, really? He goes, yeah, it's a big ensemble cast with all these people. And he goes, I'm the nobody in there. He goes, but they're, they're talking all kinds of good things about my performance. I go, really? What movie was that? He goes, Crash. And, and I, at the time, I had heard about it, but never saw the movie. And I said, well, I, yeah, I heard about it. I've never seen it. He goes, dude, he goes, I can't believe it. He goes, Oliver Stone called me, wants me to, to be a, a, one of the, a co-lead in his next film about the Twin Towers in, in New York. Wow. He goes, I filmed that after this. He goes, listen to this. He plays the, the recording. He goes, he goes, man, he goes, they're paying me six figures for that film. And he looks at me, he goes, dude, I'm not bragging. He goes, I just can't believe it. So he's a really humble guy. Obviously, his career is, is done great. And, and mm -hmm. he's, he's, a, he's a very cool dude. Um, and so congratulations for his career taking off. Another person who's whose career took off really well. I did an independent film called Fix. And um, we went and do a cast read through at the director's house, who's also, he's the, he's the director and also the husband to one of the leads in, in this independent film. So we're in this, in this artist loft in, in Venice and we're doing a cast read through. And, and for people who don't know what that is, that's when you sit down with a bunch of the people in the film and you go over that, you just read the, the, the script from cover to cover. And yeah. so, it, and during that time, his wife comes home and he makes an announcement. Hey, my wife, this is my wife so and so. She just got a uh, a series regular on House. Remember that TV show House? Oh, yeah, yeah. The doctor show. Yeah. You, you remember the girl? You remember the girl that played thirteen? Her nickname was thirteen on the show. Uh, it's been so long. I don't her, remember. Her, it, it's Olivia Wilde, is her name. She's a huge actress now and director. So wow. she blew up right after right after this. And then the last guy whose career blew up that I met before it did. I was doing a Spike Lee movie, and. You know, at first I thought, oh man, Spike Lee's going to be, you know, seeing all this like anti-police stuff or whatever. Well, he knew I was a cop when I auditioned for a, for a San Francisco cop part. I got the part. I got to be honest with you. Super cool dude, man. I mean, he, nice. he, uh, they called, they called and they go, hey man, he wants to have a dinner with all the cast. So we went to dinner and Spike went around and, and talked to everybody. And then a couple days later, we got a call from production and go, hey, Spike wants to have a, a, a softball game with all the cast and crew before we start filming. Well, that's one sport I played growing up was baseball. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, and I, and I played softball on the department team and everything else. So, so I show up, I, I was like the softball version of white men can't jump. I had this safari hat on. I had these shorts where they're all painter short. All, I had a sleeveless shirt with all my tattoos. And I show up and Spike's doing batting practice before we pick teams. And he comes over, he goes, he goes, he goes, Hey, uh, uh, you know, Spike, I go, I go, Hey Spike, Jamie he goes, Oh, I remember. He goes, Hey, we're just going to hit about three balls each. So go out there, shag. I'll call you in. We'll do some batting practice. And I look out there. I see Ed Edward Norton was out there, the wow. guy from uh, American, American History X. So I go out there. Well, I get called up to bat. Right? Well, one thing I could always do very well was hit the shit out of the ball. Yeah. So I was just boom, boom, lacing them out there. So when it came to time to pick teams, we, we had enough for four teams. And Spike's going to pick first. He goes, Jamie. <laughs> I, was on, I was on Spike's team. And then um, so we, we ended up uh, uh, filming in San Francisco. And um, – Spike comes up to me, he goes, hey, Jamie, he goes, there's a pursuit going on. And I want, around this one corner, I wanted the, the black white get really close to the camera. He goes, but I don't want to see the, the stunt driver. He goes, do you mind driving? I'm like, oh, yeah, the same type of cars that we drive. It's not a problem. Okay. Now, if Spike Lee sees this, because I've never said this on any type of interview before, he's going to realize how close he came to death that day. Because I'm driving this thing. And he goes, get as close as you can to the camera. I'm like, not a problem. And by the way, San Francisco, the hills. Uh -huh. We're filming. I'm hitting this so hard because I didn't give a shit about the car. The light bar would come off. They got to rig it back on again. I mean, I'm just beating the shit out of the car. So I'm on this stretch now. I'm on the stretch, and we're in a, we're in a mock pursuit. And I, I'm literally two feet from the camera as I go by, but I have to start negotiating for a turn at the same time because they're on a turn. Well, there's loose gravel because I'm, I'm on the side. I'm close to the – you know, I'm not really on, I'm on the pavement. I felt the rear end start to fishtail. My heart jumped. I thought I was going to fish tail, take out Spike Lee, the camera crew, and everybody else. So the next couple of takes, I'm like 20 feet away. He's like, you know, get closer. I'm like, no, we're good over here, Spike. We're good. <laughs> we're, I'm going I'm to drive over here. <laughs> but anyways, so, so one, of the, one of the actors I'm chasing, I end up losing the car in the movie. And then we come across it. Well, the car stopped. The, the one kid got out with the doping guns. He's already leave. He's already gone. So the two other guys are already 
on their hands and knees waiting for us, like kind of mocking us. So um, as I walk up, Spike goes, hey, just act normal like he normally would. So I, as I'm walking up to clear the car and I'm walking up behind the, the suspects, I go, hey, you guys straight, no heat? And one guy goes, no, we don't have any guns or we're not armed or whatever. And then they go, okay, cut, reset. The one guy stands up, looks at me, goes, you're a real cop, huh? I go, why do you say that? He goes, dude, the way you talk is just normal. It's like normal police talk. Well, that guy turned out to be Anthony Mackey. Do you know who that is? I don't. Trust me. If you see him, he's in every movie. So you remember the, the Avengers, the black guy who has the, has the yeah, yeah, like yeah. mechanical wings that come out? Oh, yeah. That's Anthony Mackey. Oh, so his like career it. blew up. So I, I, so I like to say that Michael Pena, Olivia Wilde, and Anthony Mackey should owe me because I made their careers explode after working with me. So I helped their careers. So, well, but, but, so, so that's how I, that's how I got into acting. But it, it, it's been a, it's been fun. I just did Ambulance like I don't know two years ago for Michael Bay. I just I just got done um, with um, a Chris Pratt movie, which will be out next year. Uh, it's called Mercy. Um, it's just kind of fun little projects to do. It is. I, I looked on your IMDb sheet, and it looks like you got twenty or more events on there. That's that's pretty cool. You know the. Uh, like I said, and, and I took time off because of the union, so I didn't really didn't do much for the union. And the only reason why I did the last two movies, Ambulance and, and Mercy, was because Michael Bay called me because I had do I, I had done two prior films with Michael Bay, and uh, that's by the way, Michael Bay, super super pro military and pro police. So if anybody pulls over Michael Bay. They thank you. Don't give him a ticket. Let him go. He's super cool, super, <laughs> super supportive. So, so he called me up during COVID and he goes, Hey man, I'm going stir crazy during COVID. I want to do a quick film. There's a lot of LAPD stuff. I want you to be my consultant. And so I always joke around with these guys. I'm like, Hey, I'll do it for you for free. Just got to make me a bad guy in your movie. He laughs. He goes, no, you'll be in the movie too. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, we had about 40 or 50 real LAPD officers in that movie playing extras and everything else. So uh, Michael, and, and after every day, Michael would go and, and take pictures and thank all the officers for, for nice. being in the movie. So super, super great guy. Same with Michael Mann, by the way. Michael Mann's st- same way, very pro police. And then I did, from there, one of the producers called me up to do um, Mercy, which is a, it's about Chris Pratt. He's a, a robbery homicide detective. It's a little bit into the future, so it's a little bit of AI stuff going on. Mm-hmm. So, so we, I did that film again, anybody that, that comes in contact with Chris Pratt, super guy, his brother uh, is ex law enforcement, super, super pro police and super military, which is refreshing. Cause you know, obviously you hear the horror stories about Hollywood and being kind of liberal. I've had nothing but positive contact with everybody, to be honest with you. Um, the only person I, I will say that was a little snooty, we we're doing a cash read through for collateral. We we're sitting there and it's funny cause I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm the nobody in the group. And my buddy Bob Deemer was there because he's also in the movie. The one that first got me introduced me into the with Michael mm-hmm. Mann. And then you had you had Tom Cruise, Jada Pickett Smith, Jamie Foxx, and all these other people. And and uh, Tom Cruise, super guy, super. Um, Jada Pickett Smith, kind of this half the table. She's like mm. the A lister. She's fine with. But but a funny side note about Tom Cruise. So Bob Deemer, uh, he used to give a lot of people ride alongs. And, and to be honest, he's retired now. So I can say this. I didn't even think he got approval from the department because, because we do, we're not allowed to give ride alongs. You have to be a supervisor to give a ride along. Yeah. And Bob's like, Hey, I got so-and-so on a ride along day. So I go, dude, where do you put it? I go, how are you giving them ride alongs? And, and Bob, Bob is a character. He's the only guy he's from Boston and he's been, you know, he's an LAPD officer for over 30 years. I swear his accent got worse over the 30 years and he's in LA. So I don't know what the hell happened there, yeah. but, but Bob was giving um, Tom Cruise a ride along, getting him ready for collateral. Uh, Tom Cruise goes, Hey man, I got to go to the bathroom. And he goes, okay. And Bob, Bob's a, Bob is a character. So Bob, he's in Newton division. He pulls into an alley and you understand that in South central, there's alleys, there's alleys and most of them are dirt alleys that run behind the houses because they're built back in the twenties. And then there's cross alleys, you know, that like little T intersections for right. the houses. So he pulls into an alley and goes, all right, man, you can be like one of us. You got to go, got to go in the alley. Tom Cruise being a good sport is like, okay, gets out, take a, take a, take a piss. And Bob takes off in the car and leaves him in the alley. <laughs> so here he, is, here he is at night in South Central. Can you imagine some gangsters coming down the alley going, what's Tom Cruise doing here? You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, yeah. And, and Tom Cruise had, had just got done with uh, The Last Samurai, so his hair was a little bit longer. Uh-huh. But it's Tom Cruise, you know? Yeah. But yeah. He, he, he was an absolute fantastic guy. You know, um, you know people, talk about, people talk about the Church of Scientology and everything else. And dude, all my interactions with him, super professional. He, he just wanted to hear cop stories. Super nice guy, very professional. So like I said, I've, I've had really good experiences. And I, I've, had, I've been very fortunate 
to work for some really big directors and, and yeah. pretty big stars and for them to treat me who's a nobody very good i mean it's pretty yeah. cool yeah i think you're shortchanging yourself there brother yeah the thing is they're all wannabes they want to be like you but they've got a job yeah. that yeah, it's like i say there's how many how many parties do you go to where there's non-law enforcement men there and they all come to you and want to hear your stories. And they and most of them will say, I always wanted to be a cop. And I'll look at them and say, then why didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Cause... So <clears throat> I tell everybody, I said, we can go to a barbecue, a picnic or whatever it is. And, and I try not to tell people what I do for a living, to be honest with you, especially mm -hmm. after 2020. Right. But somehow somebody it will come out, you're a cop. And when they, like you said, they want to hear stories. Right. Yeah. I got a buddy of mine who uh, lives in, lives in Miami. Um, he came out every time he comes out to LA, he wants to go out to dinner and, and it's always, uh, you never know who's going to be at the dinner with us. Right. And it's usually between six to 15 people at a dinner, right? Mostly average about eight people. So I, I'd go in there and one guy was the writer, director, producer for the, the Lincoln lawyer. Remember that, that movie? Oh yeah. And, and then another guy was the creator for full house and, and a bunch of other stuff. One guy was Kevin O'Leary from shark tank. Oh yeah. Cool, super cool guy. Nothing like the character. Super nice guy. Is that that's the one they call Mister What? Mister Wonder, Mister Wonder, Mister Wonderful. And so my buddy's in town right now. He invites me out to dinner, and who's there is Jeff Ross. You know the the roast master for. Uh, he's a comedian that does all the roasting of the celebrities and stuff. Uh -huh. He was there, but but when they find out, they do want to hear stories. Yeah, a lot of them want to hear police stories. But like I said, you know all these people that you come in contact with. So far, I mean, everybody's been pretty solid, and all the horror stories you hear hear about celebrities, I haven't experienced it. Jada Pickett Smith was a little standoffish, but I mean, um, everybody knows what she's about now. It speaks Absolutely. for itself. So Absolutely. true colors come out. Yeah. That was the same way with Narcos. Boyd Holbrook played me. Pedro Pascal played Javier. We had Wagner Moore played Pablo, all of those guys. And when, when we would go down to Columbia for filming, they were all, you're out to bar with you. Uh, Boyd and I, we actually had Boyd on the show here. He, he and I stay in touch. He was doing some independent films and, and uh, I was connecting with some people to give him some inside information about the way certain things work, yeah. but it's, uh, we, we take credit for Boyd and Pedro blowing up to where they are now. Yeah, exactly. Right. You're like, we yeah, had, I made you do. Yeah. We had nothing to do with it. We're going to take credit for it. Well, well, you know, it's funny because, you know, and then you try to text him. He doesn't, it takes a week to get back to you. Right. Dude, yeah. I made you. you know, it's, it's, I, I text Chris Pratt probably like a week and a half prior. And he just got back to me like a couple days ago. And I'm like, Bro, I thought you ghosted me. He's like, no, yeah. man, I'm busy. But he asked him to help us out with something. But he said he, he's tied up with Comic-Con uh, in New York. But he's going to hopefully be around for next year to help out with one of our charitable things here. Oh, too, nice. For, nice. We're, like, like anybody that uh, in law enforcement knows, we're constantly raising money for um, for things. Our, one of our things here is Eagle and Badge, which I'm the president of. And we raise money for officers and their families in need. So, mm -hmm. for example, if, 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 if an officer's family... Um, has a special needs kid and he's a service dog, you know, we will buy that service dog for him. And, and those things can get to be twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 sometimes, oh, yeah. depending, on, depending yeah. on what they're trained to do. We had another officer that was paralyzed. So we were able to, to get a van with a, with a lift for that, that officer. So we're constantly raising money like, like Excellent. everybody else. And like you said, like you said earlier, anybody out there that's in law enforcement or retired or whatever, I highly recommend going to the Southern California gang conference. They get about a thousand people a year. Yep. It's a great thing. Raise And, and the, the speakers they have there, class act, they're, they're so interesting. So I tell everybody that that in my whole career, that's the one conference I always look forward to every year yep. is the Southern California gang conference. And, and I was bummed. I went down there this year. I, I arrived at 10 o'clock at night. Uh, it was about midnight. My, my wife calls me. My dog was having seizures. So I had to leave immediately, drive back home. Uh, my dog was like, uh, he was close to 16 years old. Yeah. So I missed the whole conference this year. You know? I was going to say, so I, I didn't see you there. That. I didn't yeah, see you there but, this year. But my, but my dog is doing pretty good. He's, he just, we, just, we took him out for his 16th birthday. He's on medication now. So he's still trucking <laughs> along. So it, it was worth it. You know? It's a member of the family. It definitely is. Yeah. The, the What you're doing, raising the funds, that's, that's family taking care of family there. That's yeah. uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you don't get tired of me talking about the law enforcement culture, mm -hmm. but that's a perfect example right there of what we do for each other. Once you're in the family, there's only one way out and that's death. And, and so, um, or jail. And, and that's, and, and so, and so I met Mel, we talked about Mel, you know, earlier through my brother, because my brother went down to the, the conference to do a presentation on the, mm -hmm. on the uh, IRC shooting. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, hey, my brother's doing the same thing in, in L.A. He's doing these, these – on a smaller scale, but I raise money. I, I was pulling in 20000 a day for my little symposiums, right? And uh, he goes, yeah, he just had George Christie from the Hells Angels. So if you want to get George Christie down here, and, and for people that know that, 
Um, George Christie was a 40 year member of the Hells Angels, a Southern California chapter wow. president. And anybody that knows the, the history of Hells Angels, you usually hear two names, Sonny Barger and George Christie. Those are really mm-hmm. the two names you, you hear. And it was funny because George Christie, it's interesting how in our profession, we meet certain individuals. And uh, I grew up in Ventura. George Christie's chapter was out of Ventura. So when I go on Facebook, I have like 40 mutual friends with them. Yeah. This town is fairly small. And so when I was looking for, I was going to do a, a symposium on outlaw uh, motorcycle gangs. I got my, some of my buddies from uh, ATF, John Carr and, and cause to come in and, and do it. Oh, yeah. Trade them. yeah. Great guys. And so um, I brought them in. I also wanted to see if I can get George Christie. And the reason why I thought about George Christie was he had retired and uh, he did a, like a five part episode on the history channel regarding stuff. Now, it's funny because George is a very good speaker for the History Channel, and uh, he's not going to tell us where the bodies are buried, but he tells stories that aren't going to get him in trouble, but they're still interesting stories. Yeah. So I actually went on um, Facebook, and I sent him a message. I said, hey, uh, George, my name is Jamie McBride. I'm from Ventura. I graduated Ventura High School in this year, this, that, and the whole thing. I'm now a Los Angeles police detective. I'm doing the symposium, yada, yada, yada. Would you be interested in coming and talking? And he goes, sure. Here's my number. Give me a call. Wow. Wow. So I, so I ended up meeting him at a restaurant in uh, Ventura and uh, talked to him and he had never did a presentation like this. So I kind of helped him do his PowerPoint kind of that stuff. And then he came and, and did it. And then from there, it was kind of interesting story. I had this lady call me. She's a producer. She goes, Hey, Jamie, and she does a lot more reality show stuff. She goes, Hey, Jamie, I'm looking for ideas for a reality show. Do you have any, anything in mind? And I just pulled this one out of my ass, right? When she asked me, I said, well, you know what? How about an investigative show like we like you see already that's out there? I said, investigate like unsolved murders, crimes, whatever it might be. But on the investigative team, there's three people. There's a detective, me. I go, we'll get like a, an attorney, like maybe a prosecutor or something like that. But they we, we also have a criminal. That way you get the criminal minds aspect on what might happen. Yeah. She, goes, she goes, I love it. She goes, who do you have in mind? I said, George Christie from the Hells Angels. She goes, oh my God, you can get him? I said, yeah, I can get him. So that ended up not materializing at the time. But from there, we hooked, uh, George got hooked up with a, a producer. He took off and went to, I think it was Italy for like two years and went and did a uh, show and produced it, I guess. It's kind, of, it's kind of like the Italy's version of uh, Sons of Anarchy. Wow. And so he went out there, he went out there and did that and he came back, you know, and, but George, George is a character, man. He, interesting guy. Yeah. Very interesting guy. Yeah. So I tell you what, man, this is, I, I could sit here and listen to war stories all day. I, I like to joke around that what we like to do as cops is drink beer and tell war stories. And I don't drink beer anymore. So I love war stories. This has been yeah. a real treat to have you on here. Uh, brother, I can't thank you enough. It's, it gives the whole point of doing this is to give our listeners an inside look of what really goes on in the police department. And I love the, the pranks that we pull on, on each other. Yeah. One of our big things was when we were in the roll call, you'd light a cigarette before you go in and you, you stick the, the fuse of a firecracker in the cigarette, take the filter off and you burn the other end and it'll take four or five minutes for that to light the fuse. And then it you know, oh, yeah. blows off. Is that one of the most juvenile things you could ever do? Absolutely. But it's hilarious when it happens and the sergeant well, well, craps his pants. And- <laughs> well, I, I know we're going long, but I got to tell you a story since you brought that up. So the, the pranks thing is what you live for. Right? Mm-hmm. You constantly are pranking people. So working 77th division at the old station before they tore it down, we had a, a sergeant who was constantly, she's a female, constantly battling the bulge. Mm-hmm. So she's always on these diets. Well, at that station, like many stations, you would take your uniform, put a note in there, it was my uniform, put the money in there, put it in there, and then a cleaning service would take it out of the bin, launder it, bring it back. Yeah. So we'd, go, we'd tell the female officers, go, hey, go see if Cookson's uh, uniform's in there. So she oh, yeah, it is. She'd bring it here. We'd go, we'd put uh, extra money in there, go take in half inch. So we're constantly, we'd constantly, we'd constantly take her waistline and go in, out, in, out. And she couldn't figure it out. She thought she's losing weight, gaining weight, losing weight, gaining weight. So we, we you know, we used to prank people on that. And oh, I, I remember funny. when they, when they tore down that station, we moved to temporary trailers in, um, before, while they're building a new station. And I remember they had these, these, planter boxes in the front of the uh the watchmaner's trailer and the yeah. watchman at night used to come out there and smoke all the time i'm not saying who did this to say it <laughs> happened but but there there, there were some marijuana plants that were confiscated confiscated and replanted in that flower bed right there oh, and, yeah. and, and i remember the watchman going out there smoking turns around and there's like four marijuana plants planted <laughs> in behind his office but but those are just things that are just like i mean we oh, like yeah. say we can go on all day and tell stories but Man, when you told that, it just reminds you of the other ones. And I'm like, I forgot yeah. about it. Yeah, we did this, did this. Yeah, it does. It just keeps going and going. So 
I'm not going to hold you any longer, man. Thank you so much for being on the show. I, you know, appreciate the camaraderie and I appreciate the humor. I hope that our listeners do. I think they do. I think okay. this will be a big hit. And uh, brother, is there, if there's ever anything I can do for you, all you got to do is ask. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Certainly an honor. So if you'll stand by just for a minute while everything uploads and for all our listeners, stand by for the debrief. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Game of Crimes with Murph in the Morning. I can't thank you guys enough for taking the time to see and hear some of the best true crime content you can find anywhere. I know none of this will be possible without your support, and I don't take that very lightly. You keep me motivated to find the best guests out there so we can all hear their tales of bravery and daring do. You know, and I'm extremely proud of the guests that come on the show. Their willingness to be so transparent and honest about their lives and experiences. You know, before each episode, I ask the guests if there's anything they don't want to talk about. 99% of the time, they tell me nothing is off the table with them. I can ask anything. In fact, the only time they ask me not to mention something, like where they live or maybe please don't show their faces, is because they are still receiving death threats because of some of the courageous and unbelievable acts they were involved with. These are real-life heroes, ladies and gentlemen, people just like me and you with families who risk their very lives to protect and defend all of us every single day. You've probably heard the saying, real heroes don't wear capes, right? That's who I'm talking about. These studs and studettes, they don't wear capes and they don't parade around like fictional superheroes that we see on the movies or on TV. Our heroes wear uniforms, body armor, bulletproof helmets, knife-resistant gloves, gun belts. They carry handguns, long guns, stun guns, anything that they can find to help protect themselves and us. Just think about that for a second. Does your job, does your career require any of this? Thank God we have men and women willing to take, make these sacrifices and do these jobs. And thank God for their families as well. I refer to them as our unsung heroes. They keep life running on the home front, not really knowing if their husband, wife, child, brother, sister, whoever, if they'll make it home at the end of their shift or the end of their tour. You think that might cause a little tension around the house, a little stress, anxiety, post-traumatic stress syndrome, maybe even thoughts of suicide. It takes a special person to tolerate and endure that. They do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Now, a quick side note here, regardless of who you are, if you or someone you know is struggling with any of these conditions, conditions like overwhelming stress, anxiety, hopelessness, PTSD, please don't think you're alone. If you need someone to talk to and you don't know where to turn, there's the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. All you have to do is dial or text 988. That's it, 988. Their lines are manned around the clock every day of the year. They'll find someone, a professional, for you to talk to and get the support you need. Again, it's just dial 988. One other thing about our guests that I find so admirable is the fact that they didn't stop serving once they retired. Almost all, if not all of them, continue to serve others in some capacity after retirement, don't they? I have a saying that applies here. Just because we retire, that doesn't mean our oath's expired. Is that a little corny? Yeah, sure is. But that's the way most of these heroes feel. It's their creed, their mantra, to keep, to keep doing good things for other people. So to all our guests here on Game of Crimes, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for your service to our communities to our countries, and for taking the time to tell us about your adventures. To you, I say, job well done, brothers and sisters. May God bless and protect all the men and women in law enforcement, our military, and all our first responders. Now, if you like this week's episode, head on over to Apple or Spotify and hit those five stars for me. It only takes you a minute, and it really helps support the show. If you didn't know this already, Game of Crimes is now on YouTube. Just type in Game of Crimes Podcast in the search bar at the top and see what you think. And while you're there, do me a favor, click on that subscribe button, the like button if you'd like, and feel free to share that with all your friends. You can send me your comments on Apple, Spotify, 
YouTube, or to my email address, which is gameofcrimespodcast at gmail.com. My website is gameofcrimespodcast.com. This is where you'll find all our episodes, books written by some of our guests, some merchandise, and more. On Facebook and Instagram, you can find me at Game of Crimes Podcast, and on X, X, type in Game of Crimes. Also on Facebook, now you got to check this out. Go to, go to Game of Crimes fans and join the best private group on the Facebook platform. This group is run by our favorite mafia queen, Sandy Salvato. She's the lady that rules with an iron fist, but she does wear a velvet glove. And if you're looking for even more content, go to patreon.com slash Game of Crimes and sign up. There you'll find bonus episodes each month ranging from serious and current topics to some silly and fun events. And you can get early access audio to each week's interviews before they drop on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. And I'm talking those are free of commercials, comment, commentary, and music. You just hear the podcast. You can even subscribe for free on patreon.com slash game of crimes and hear the first five minutes of each episode to help you decide if you'd like to spend some of your hard-earned cash to hear more. Again, that's patreon.com slash game of crimes. Do me a huge favor. Tell your friends about Game of Crimes. Invite them to check out the show. I appreciate you helping me spread the word about the best weekly true crime podcast out there. Am I a little biased? Yeah, probably. As I mentioned earlier, your support, and I mean this, this is what keeps me going. One last thought. It's okay for us to have different ideas and different opinions, but it doesn't mean we can't continue to be friends, okay? Finally, thanks for joining me to play the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all, the game of crimes. I'll see y'all next week.